preaching minister in the Walnut Church of Christ in Texarkana on June the 4th, 2017. Thanks. Uh, following his father, John, who served over 18 years, Patrick and Carrie Ann have been married for 30 years. They have four children, Bailey, 26, Samuel, 24, Abby, 22, Daniel, 19. The newest addition to the family is their first granddaughter, Eden. Wonderful name. Patrick has been in full-time ministry for over 30 years, with 18 of those years with the Lamar, <coughs> Lamar Avenue Congregation in Paris, Texas. Patrick has a bachelor's degree in Bible from Abilene Christian University and graduate studies in ministry from Harding University. He says his goal in preaching is to transform the biblical text into a practical, life-changing message so that people can see what it means to follow Jesus every day. Now, before Patrick comes up, I'm going to say a prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we ask that you be with us as we worship you. Father, we ask that you be with practice be with Patrick as he brings us to lesson. And Father, we ask that you would give him recall of the things that he had studied. Father, we also bring, ask that you would be with those of, the, of our flock here who are suffering from illness and disease and injuries. Father, it should be with Becky Odom and others that have severe injuries and are facing difficult decisions. We ask that you would be with them, that you'd be with Carol Newman and Pete Sifford. Father, we know that they would want to be here with us, but their health will not let them. Father, we have many others that are suffering. We ask that you would be with them and that you would heal them. Father, we know that you're the great re healer, and we know that you will do your, your will. Father, we thank you for our privilege as your children to approach your throne of grace, to leave our petitions there, and to know, Father, that you will answer them. I pray, Father, that you will <clears throat> be with us and our impatience sometimes with when things get done. But, Father, we know it's all on your time and your will. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, who lived amongst us, who brought your word down to us, and who taught us how to worship you and praise you and how to live our life accordance to his will and then to die such a tragic death and anger and anguish on the cross of Calvary. Father, we ask that you would uh, continue to be with us here at the Mesquite Congregation. Father, it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. One more time, make sure you're awake. Good evening, church. Good evening. All right. David, thank you for the songs. I'm going to say what David did. Let's go old school tonight. Do we have our Bibles? Can I see the Bibles? Psalm books don't count. Okay? That's wonderful. Thank you. Turn to 1 John 4, and uh, we'll be reading there in just a moment. As I was driving over, this afternoon from Texarkana, I started thinking about uh, how many years I've been coming uh, to Mesquite to speak on Wednesday nights, and I believe this is my seventh, um, and uh, I love coming every summer. This is one of the highlights of my summer. I love seeing all of you. Uh, I feel like I'm coming home, and, uh, and really, when you think about that, that's what the church is all about, Amen. And uh, so thank you for making me feel so welcomed, and I love this church, I love Devin, 
Devin and I and our relationship, we go back many years when we were younger and we were youth ministers. And uh, we love talking about those youth ministry days. And we really love to be able to say there's life after youth ministry. Uh, can I get an amen on that? Wow. Uh, our youth group in Texarkana, they are at Harding University this week. They'll be coming home tomorrow. They've been up there for Uplift, and it has been a fantastic week. Uh, I don't know if y'all are involved in that work or not, but it, uh, God's doing some mighty work on that campus with that camp. Uh, with, uh, there's over 1,000 young people going next week, and there was between six and 700 there this week. And so, uh, boy, I'm just thrilled to know that our teens are out and serving and, and uh, just growing in their faith. And, and I want to talk to us tonight about that. I love the theme that Devin has chosen. It's a very challenging theme, I will tell you that. Um, Devin always does something uh, when he puts this out. He wants us ministers to choose our top three uh, lessons and top three dates. And so... I always try to look for that email soon so I can just hit reply just as fast as I can. And when I saw this one, I thought, oh, wow, what a challenging theme this is, but what a timely theme it is, right? And so uh, I was blessed to get my first choice, and that is, what is love? You know, it's very common today when you want to know something or search for something, just ask Dr. Google, right? And uh, that's what I call them. And a lot of people search Dr. Google. We're going to talk about that in a moment. I want to take us back about 10, 11 years. Um, an enormous financial crisis was taking place in Europe. And the very survival of the structure of the euro was at stake. And so all eyes at that time were on one man, the head of the European Central Bank. And so financial markets and, and everybody else plunged all through the morning, and the only question on anybody's lips was simply this, what will he say? In the morning when he addresses the people, what will he say? And his words would either cause an implosion or who knows, right? Well, so on the morning of July 26, 2012, he stood up, and when asked what he would do to protect the euro, he answered in three simple words, and they'll be on the screen tonight, and they simply are, say this with me, whatever it takes. Say it again. Whatever it takes. And at that moment, Everybody was just like, ha. Oh. And as soon as he spoke those words, guess what? The market began to rally. And the immediate crisis was over. And the euro was secured. Now, I know a lot has taken place since then, not just in Europe, but even to this day as we speak right here in the United States, right? But folks, I want to tell us something. We don't belong to this world. We belong to God's kingdom. And in the kingdom of God, it cannot be shaken. And every day of our life, knowing that we are in God's kingdom, listen to this, we are secure. We are safe. We are okay because we're in the hands of our Creator. Now, I want you to think about those three words tonight. Whatever it takes, there's a challenge there for us. When confronted with a world in need of the gospel, with a world crying out in pain, with a world that's just divided by inequality and poverty and need, the question is, how will we respond? Will we hunker down and ignore the outside world, or will we be willing to say whatever it takes? And I want to say at the beginning tonight, 
I think you know my heart, but I want to I remind us of something. When I say whatever it takes, I want you to hear two things. Number one, this right here, the Word of God, never changes. But our methods and the way that we strive to reach people, they have to change. We don't do church the way we did 50 years ago, do we? Think about it. Some things are still, and I'm not talking about the gospel. I'm not talking about things right here. But the way that we live out and the way that we do church is different. David gave us an example of that tonight. We went old school by picking up a songbook. We don't do that as much anymore because we have the screens. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm a big fan of the screens from this perspective. It gets our head out of the books and up. And I believe it's helped congregational singing. That's a little thing. That's not something that should ever divide us. It's not something that, you know, that we should even have many conversations about. But we have. But hopefully we're past those, right? But what we begin to realize is we change if we see that it helps us, if we see that it encourages us, if we see that change is good for those that are coming to the Lord, we begin to realize that methods, it's okay to do things a little different. How many of you remember when we had gospel meetings? Raise your hand. How many of you remember when they lasted two weeks? And we're good today to get people to come two days a week, right? Much less two weeks. Did they serve a purpose back then? I believe they did. Would they serve a purpose today? Mm, I may step on some toes. Probably not. But are there some other ways that we can reach people? Yes. And you know what I love about this church? You're finding those ways. I know that the Mesquite Church of Christ, y'all do an incredible job with the elementary schools. And you have an impact on those campuses. You probably didn't do that or didn't even think about doing that 50 years ago, right? It, it wasn't really that popular to do. But now we have opportunities to get into schools and other places that maybe at once we couldn't do. Will we be willing to do whatever it takes to see our communities restored and our workplaces transformed and our world healed? Whatever it takes to see justice and righteousness roll on like a river. Whatever it takes to see our friends and family and colleagues come to realize that they too are known and loved and called by their Father in heaven. I want to ask you a question tonight, and that question simply is, do you feel loved by God? Do you feel loved by God? Has there ever been a moment or times in your life where you didn't really feel that love? Now, I know we're in church, but we need to be honest in church, right? Are there moments and times where we don't feel loved by God? Thank you, because I want to tell you something, church. Outside of these walls, there are millions of people that don't feel that, that don't know that. And I'm looking at people tonight, and I'm included in this. How many of you are here tonight, and you're a child of God because somebody mentored you. Somebody believed in you. Somebody taught you the gospel. Raise your hand. Oh, look at there. Maybe it's parents, grandparents, a friend, an aunt or an uncle, some family member, somebody, let's say it like this, somebody took a chance on you, right? Somebody loved you. There's a very popular scripture, kind of like Google, 
I love to look at my Bible app. How many of you have the Bible app, U version? It's wonderful. Every day, you know this, they have a verse of the day. I, I, I look forward every day to seeing what that verse is. And typically, sometime during that day, something will dawn on me to think, you know, I really needed to hear and be reminded of that particular verse. God has a way of reaching us and touching our hearts, doesn't He? And so, we're familiar with John 3.16, aren't we? If you ask Google and you ask YouTube on the Bible app, it's one of the most read verses of the Bible. A few years back, I did a sermon series on the top ten scriptures that people Google and people want to search. John 3.16 is on there every time. So John 3.16, we're familiar with it, which clearly states that because God loved the world, He sent His Son to those who believe in Him would never perish. You know, maybe sometimes we think of God's love as generally just applying to everyone, but maybe not specifically applying to me personally. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that, but one of the things that we see in God's Word, God loves you. Let me say that again. God loves you. We can never get tired of hearing that, can we? You ever get tired of your child or your grandchild or your spouse saying, I love you? If you say yes to that, you better come talk to me after church, right? No, we don't ever get tired of that. Do you feel loved by God? You see, that's not just a general application because the God that we serve is a God who seeks to have a personal relationship with you. His desire is really to have a personal relationship with everyone in the world. You know why? Because He created them. You go back and you, you, do, a, you do a summary of, of the Old Testament. One of the things that you begin to realize uh, in Genesis 1 and 2, you see God's plan. You see His desire. And each day, God said what? It was good. What you begin to realize in Genesis is, this is who God is. This is what God imagined. And you've got to really put your thinking cap on and, and really go deep with God to see that He formed the world from nothing. And He spoke. And the very words that he spoke are words of love. And then Satan enters the picture in Genesis 3. You know what Satan does to us? He speaks lies. He's the father of all lies. He distorts everything that's good. And so spiritual warfare is just all over the place, right? And it will be until Jesus comes back. And for everyone who believes and who practices the commandments of God, guess what? Satan is after you. That's just the way he is. And so then you begin to realize God formed Israel. He doesn't give up. Even though Satan comes along, he doesn't give up. And he calls Abraham to be a blessing to the world. And he gives the people the law. And the law, then it wasn't a burden like it is with us sometimes as we read through it. It was a gift. It's what made the people unique at the time compared to everyone else. You know why? Because it was given to them by God. Folks, that is love. And then we see 
that Israel decided, you know, we want to go our own way. And so all the nations would know who I am. And they just started doing what they wanted to do. At that time, God could have said, you know what? I'm done. It's not working. He really could have. But he didn't. You know why? Because God is love. And God does something that sometimes we struggle with. God sees the big picture. He believes in you. And one of the things that he saw, and you see this in every book of the Bible, that someone better is coming. We call it prophecy. And all through Scripture, all through the Old Testament, we see someone better is coming. So I asked my class this the other night at church, Aren't you glad the scriptures didn't end in Malachi? Right? I mean, the Old Testament ends like a shipwreck. The world is still broken, still corrupt. You have 400 years of silence, and then guess what? Here comes Jesus. I love Matthew's gospel, don't you? It's called the transitional gospel. You know why? Because he does a marvelous job of making that transition from the old to the new. And all the way through that, what you begin to realize, God's love never stopped. Even with Israel, he could have said, I'm done. But he didn't. Folks, let me tell you something. Grace and mercy is not just reserved for New Testament people. Grace and mercy is all through Scripture. Right? Can, can't you think of all the Old Testament stories where here's His grace, here's His mercy. And so what Israel failed to do as a nation, Jesus does as a person. And I love Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church. I believe wholeheartedly that God's plan and His mission is still to be accomplished through the church. Don't you? God's plan is right here, the church, because it's his body. It's his bride. It's a community. Not just any community, it's a community of faith. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, should be on the screen as well. Let's read this together. Should be two more slides, I believe, Stephanie. 1 John 4, verse 7. Let's read this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And His love is poured out in our hearts, and He is enabling us to love Him in return. Folks, I want to tell you, in order for us to go out into the world and love and here's my assignment, those in their 20s, we have to feel that love from God ourselves first. And I, I'm going to tell you, I love the assignment, but I'm going to tell you, it's not just the 20s that struggle with these questions. It's all of us. And sometimes even those of us that have been raised in the church all of our life, we still struggle with some of these questions, don't we? What is hell? What is love? What is life? What is heaven? What is the Bible? What is the church? What is prayer? Who is Jesus? Who is God? I'm going to tell you, don't take any of those for granted 
at any point in your life. Know, know what you believe and why you believe it. Scripture says, be able and be ready to give an answer to anyone. Why? Because we have hope. And at one time in our life, we were lost. But I love Romans. What does Paul say at just the right time? What did Jesus do? He died. That's love, right? He demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, it doesn't say while we came and cleaned our act up, while we straightened up, while we cleaned up. No. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the sake of time tonight, I'm going to give you some scriptures, and then I want to get very practical with us. People who Jesus touched became contagious. You know, sometimes when we hear that word contagious, we think of it in a bad sense. Somebody's got a cold or somebody has COVID-19. I know we don't like to say that anymore. And, and we just, we go crazy and we just don't want to be around them, right? I, I get that. You don't want to be sitting next to somebody with the flu, right? I understand that. But you can also be contagious in a good way. You can be joyful. You can be someone of good moral character. You can be in a good mood. You get to choose to do that, right? But when you look at the overall life and ministry of Jesus, there's no doubt he was a contagious person. Think about it. Look at the leper. Look at the demon-possessed man. Look at the woman at the well. Look at Peter. Look at Philip. They all were touched by Jesus with his love, and as a result, they had a story to tell. And they couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to go out into the streets and into the marketplaces and everywhere they could to let people know, I am not the same that I was because I met someone named Jesus. And I did more than just meet him, I fell in love with him. Are you still in love with Jesus? You see, God's desire for the church today, He wants us to be a contagious church. He wants us to be infected with the presence and the power of Christ. He wants us to love people the way that His Father did. He wants us to be gracious to people. like they were, right? You know, for years, I'm afraid what we did, whether we meant to or not, this may, this may hurt, but I'm going to say it. For years, we criticized and we browbeat sinners that we were supposed to be winning to the Lord. Sorry, I'm just going to say it. Do you believe me? Do you agree with that? Again, not that we did it on purpose. But I had a dear friend several years ago teach me something that I fought for so many years. Perception is reality. Perception is reality. I think what we seen in the last, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years, maybe longer, I think as the church, I think we've repented in the sense that we've realized that we've got to stop pretending, that we've got to stop thinking that we've got it all together and that we are perfect. 
right? If you go out and ask the average 25-year-old, ask Google or not, you go ask the average 25-year-old, I'm going to tell you a lot in that generation are scared to death and fearful of being right here in this room. Not just because it's Mesquite Church of Christ, but any worship center. They are. And sometimes we look at that and say, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, you can say that, you can think that, but if it's their perception, it's their reality. And so there's some lessons that I believe we can learn from that. If we see ourselves like everybody else on the same playing field, it really helps. Right? Because at one time, we were just like the 25-year-olds that are asking questions today. Right? And maybe we're 75 today or 35. Maybe we're still asking these questions. It's okay. And if we can't ask them in the church, where can we ask them? Right? Folks, we've got to stop pretending. We've got to stop thinking that we come here because we have it all together. A few years ago, I did a sermon series during Christmas, and in one of those sermons, I, I just made the point that no perfect people are allowed at our church. And the next morning, one of our ladies who did the marquee sign, we don't have it anymore because we've gone digital, right? Uh, we, threw, we threw the old one away, David. She put up there, no perfect people allowed. And it stayed on our church sign for three years. There was a reason for that. I didn't know it was going to do this. It started a lot of conversation with people that would drive by our building. I was in Walmart one day and someone said, aren't you the preacher at Walnut Church of Christ down on Moore's Lane? I said, I am. And he said, oh my goodness, he said, um, is that where no perfect people are allowed? And I said, that's correct. And he said, wow. Thank you. Now why, why? Why do we say that? What does Luke 5 say? It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. Can you be a Christian and still be sick? Yes, absolutely. Can you be a Christian and still not have it all together? Yes. That's why we need a Savior. Amen? That's love. The Lord giving us something that we don't deserve. I see a lot of head shaking. We get that, right? And you know what we need to do with the 25-year-olds out on the streets that are asking those questions? We need to be real with them. And just like somebody who believed in you and who mentored you and who taught you the gospel, we need to be patient with people and be able to answer their questions as honestly as we know how. Because one of the things, if you ask Google, I don't know if Google will tell you this, but the 25-year-olds will, they want us to be real. Don't give an answer that seems right. Give an answer that's right from here. And if you don't know what is the best thing to do, say it. Say, what a great question. I really don't know the answer to that. But let's, let's work on that. Let's find it. Let's search it together. So I'm going to try to wrap this up in about 10 minutes. And I'm going to give you some practical things that we are doing at Walnut. And, and I don't say these things to brag. I say these things because it's a lot of stuff that we have learned. And we're still learning it. And I know that you are as well. Every Sunday... For the past 20 years, actually for the past 
23 years, 24 years now, we, have, we offer a class called New Friends Class. It's a class for first-time visitors. It's a class for anyone that wants to know more about Walnut Church of Christ. We meet in our library. My wife and I are there and two other families that have been in our church for 25 to 30 years. Every Sunday, we are blessed to meet with people. And one of the things that we've noticed We have met people from every age group, but we did something a few years back. We were very strategic with this. When we came back from COVID, we purposely started a class for those in their 20s and 30s. One reason, because one Sunday morning, there was a young couple in our class. They had been visiting a while. They were... 25 at the time, and he said, I have a question. He said, we've been coming to Walnut for about a year. We love this church. What, what's offered for our age group? I will never forget that. And I mean, it just kind of hit me right between the eyes. And the other two families looked at my wife and I, and we were like, oh my goodness. And I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. Not a lot right now. Now, 20 years ago, when those right now, those that are in their 40s in our church, when they were in their 20s, they started a class and they had all these dreams and, and all these wonderful things. And in fact, one of the ministries we have in our church was started by the 20 year olds at that time going out and feeding the homeless once a month. And that ministry is still continuing today. But one of the things that happened when those 20-year-olds grew up and they were 30 and 35, we just kind of coasted. And we just thought, well, we had something for the 20s, right? But then we forgot something. There's another group of 20s coming around the corner. And so we started a class specifically for 20s and 30s. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's one of our largest Bible classes every Sunday morning. It grew. And the people in that class, they started telling their friends and those that they work with, y'all need to come check our church out. We have something for our age group, and it's amazing. We put three or four uh, older guys and, and families in that class to mentor and to teach. We've now turned that class over to three of our younger men, and they are doing an incredible job. But one of the things that we do in that new friends class, we listen to people. We allow guests to ask us anything that they want to ask. And we meet people that, some who were raised in the Church of Christ all their life, and we, met, we meet some. The other day, we had a Catholic, a Presbyterian, a Baptist, and a Methodist. That was their background. Praise God that they walked into a Church of Christ. Amen? Amen? Because years ago, I'm not sure you would have seen that. Okay? Got, folks, I'm being as honest as I know how. We've had questions asked to us all over what the Bible is and about Jesus. In the last two years, we have baptized... Husbands and wives. Because they told us, this is not what we did. This is not how we experienced Jesus. We need them. Isn't that beautiful? And that's not anything we've done. That's the gospel. 
That's the Holy Spirit convicting people. But we were intentional, and we still are, very intentional. In fact, we even got so brave that we told people, if you're above, if you're in your 40s or above, we really don't want you going to that class. Yeah, we, we really rubbed some the wrong way. But when the church realized we are starting this class to target that age group and to really reach them, they begin to realize and understand it. Because you know what people in their 20s and 30s want? They want to know that they can be safe where they are, that they can be real and that they can share things and be open and honest. The other day, about four months ago, we had a guy that um, worked for the city for the pound. He parked his truck in our uh, driveway. And I thought, man, I, don't, I didn't know we had a loose dog on the campus. But anyway, he came up, knocked on the door, and he said, uh, my name's Tanner, and I need to see if I can talk to someone about the Lord. I about fell over, right? You just don't see that very often. I said, man, you've come to the right place. I uh, went and grabbed one of my co-workers and we went to our church library and he just started pouring his heart out. He said, I, I, I want to tell you where I've been in my life. Can I do that? And I said, absolutely. And I said, you can share it all and it all stays right here. And he started talking about his past and he looked at me and he said, I'm here because I... I'm tired of living that life and I want something different. He had a fiance. They had a child. And he asked me, he said, will we be welcomed in this church? And I said, yes, you will. Now, what I did not do at that point is I did not say on the first visit, we need to talk about this arrangement. And I did that on purpose because he probably would have never come back. Now I know that that may rub some the wrong way. I talked to my shepherds about it and they were like, hey, beautiful, yes. So, that was on a Wednesday. He said, what time does church start tonight? And I said, 6.30. He said, I'll be there. You know, sometimes we hear that and we think, yeah, right. He was there at 6 o'clock. Sat in my class and I had told some of our people in our auditorium class, hey, there's going to be a new couple here tonight named Tanner and Ashley. I want you all to meet them. They were, I mean... I don't know if they were ready for this, but they got baptized in fire by love, right? They were smiling from ear to ear. That night, he said, can we study the Bible together? And I said, yes, we can. How about Tuesday night at 6.30? In our new friends class, all of our people in our new friends class, we started a Bible study with them. We baptized he and Ashley. I did their wedding three weeks ago. They got it, and they knew once we had a relationship, hey, we, we got to talk about something. Life in the kingdom and life under the lordship of Christ, here's what it looks like. You, you need to get married. Yes, we want to. Ask me if I would do it. Absolutely. Standing there three weeks ago, and as she comes down the aisle, and they're arm in arm looking at me. You know what she said before, right after I said, who's blessing this lovely bride's hand in marriage. You know what she said? Next week, when I get back from my honeymoon, can we study Ecclesiastes? <laughs> I'm not sure Google would have said that. You know what I told her? I said, yes, but first we need to do the wedding. And later, someone said, hey, what were y'all talking about right before you started the ceremony? I said, I ah, don't worry about it. 
you know, but I, I love that because it's real. And you're taking people where they are and you're helping them realize you don't have to stay that way because the gospel won't let you stay that way. Right? There's another couple in our church named Zach and Brianna. They did not grow up in the Church of Christ. They started coming to our church by an invitation from a friend and an employee. Would you like to come to church with me? Yes. My wife and I and our two little kids, we stay home on Sunday. We don't have a place to go. He came and they sat on the second row one Sunday. He had never sung a cappella. He didn't really know what it was. He was really kind of scared of it. And he came to our new friends class that morning and he said, oh my goodness, I love this. He said, I, I went to a little church and, you know, it was instrumental and, and all of that. And um, he said, man, this, this was wonderful. Three months later, we baptized them into Christ, husband and wife. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you can't make that up. But that's what the gospel does. Last week at our VBS, she came up to me in tears, and she, they helped us in our class, my wife and I, and she said, we have had so much fun this week. And she said, I am so thankful that we found the Lord and that we found this church. She said, it has changed our life. And she said, no, it hasn't just done that. It has changed our marriage. Hmm. I could tell you some more stories about some. On Thursday nights, we have a Bible study, men's Bible study. We study for about an hour, and then we play volleyball. I know that's kind of a, a weird scenario, but that's what we do. And so... When that Bible study started about 15 years ago, way before I got to Walnut, we used to have to beg men to do a devotional. Now there's a waiting list. You know why? Because the new, younger guys that have come to our church and that have found the Lord, they have asked, can we share our testimony with the rest of these men? Yes, you can. We need you to. Tanner shared his a month ago. Uh, another, Zach has shared his many, many times. I mean, they, they just want to talk. They want to be real. And they want to share the struggles and the ins and outs and all of it. And, and we're still doing something that God wants us to do as Christians. We're practicing discipleship. Folks, listen to me. In the churches of Christ, we've got baptism down really well. I believe where we have really not done a very good job, in my opinion, is discipling people. When, when someone is baptized into Christ, we can't assume they're okay. They're going to be okay. Hey, you know what? Somebody discipled you. Disciples disciple disciples. Look at Acts. That wasn't an accident. They were discipled. We started the discipleship class uh, six months ago, and one of our men started teaching it, and... All of a sudden, we looked up and we thought, you know, this class is going to be filled with, with our new converts, with those that have, you know, recently found Christ. You know who it was filled up with? 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds. And you know what they told us? We're not sure we ever really got this discipleship thing down. Wow. Thank you for your honesty. Right? What does Jesus say in the Great Commission? All authority has been given to me. Go, make disciples, baptizing them, right? 
Don't give up. Let people be real. And give them honest answers from Scripture, yes. But let them be real. And let their faith just be right on out there. And may our faith be right out there with them. And may we always be able to say we're on the same playing field. Their sins and my sins and your sins, they're at the foot of the cross. Amen? We're redeemed. We've been rescued. We've been delivered. And to be contagious, we have to do more than talk about forgiveness and love and compassion and grace and mercy. We've got to demonstrate it in a real way. And if you don't, if we don't, I'm just going to tell you, those in their 20s are going to walk out the door. Those in their 30s are going to walk out the door. And 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, you get the picture? We've been redeemed, and we have to show that to other people. I don't know where you are in your life. I know you're in this room tonight, and I'm glad but I also know that in a crowd this size, somebody's hurting. Maybe you've had a bad week or a bad day. I don't know. But I know this. This is a great church that loves you. They'll walk with you. They'll talk with you. They'll be patient with you. They will. They'll do all of it. We've got to be real, folks. People in our world are hurting. They're confused, aren't they? And if you look at all the statistics and all the numbers and all the data and everything else, people aren't, they're really not down that much on people. But the data shows we got work to do in building that trust gap between the people in their 20s and the church and their perception. And you know how you change that? Go be Jesus. When someone in our class looks at us and says, this is not the typical church of Christ, or this is not the church of Christ that we thought it might be. Praise God for that, whatever that means, right? And, and we're not doing anything crazy, so don't get worried, okay? We're just loving people. We're loving people the way that God did. We're not watering down anything. We're not doing any of that. We're just being real. But in the process... We're letting people know, we ha we've gotten a lot of people, and I'm sure y'all have too, that come out of a legalistic background. You know what I'm talking about. Folks, let me tell you something. Christianity is not about the rules and the do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship. Now, are there some things that you do and you don't do? Yes. But that's not what it's based on. It's based on a love relationship with God. You know that. I love this church and I love your heart. And I love that you want to be challenged um, in some new ways. Amen? Uh, and just, just remember, all these questions that people are asking Google, we're probably asking them ourselves in the church. And that's okay. It's okay. But I pray more than ever that you feel loved by God and that you can go out and share that love with a lost and dying world. 
And as David comes to lead us in a song, only a step. You know, taking that first step is hard. Taking that first step to deny self and follow Jesus, it's hard. But boy, once you do it, isn't it wonderful? If there's anything we can do for you tonight, we ask that you come right now as we stand and sing.